This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Being locked up through no fault of one's own is unfair and unfortunate, whether in a prison built of bricks or in a prison of one's own mind. Autism is a disease we hear a lot about today amid increasing discovery of methods and technologies that can help those affected to communicate and thrive. But our conversation about autism should look deeply into our past. Journalist Steve Silberman discusses autism's history as a guide to its future in Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism, and the Future of Diversity. And then, if our society has often failed those with autism by not providing enough opportunity, tens of thousands of Americans today have been failed by having their opportunity cut short as they've been falsely imprisoned for someone else's crimes. New York Post reporter Ruvain Fenton discusses his book, Stolen Years, Stories of the Wrongfully Imprisoned. But first, here's my interview with Steve Silberman. When you look at conspiracy theories, I always feel like there's this grain of, of reality in them uh, that, that you can find of, of what people are really getting at. And with autism, uh, we saw this real push to find a cause of autism, and there was the fraudulent work of, of Andrew Wakefield about vaccines, there's been a bunch of other stuff, and what, what seems to be driving all of that is this idea that autism is new, right? right? That underlying this all is that, that people believe it came from somewhere, it's now on the scene, and it is true that we have this new word, relatively new word for it, but you suggest that really not, not much has changed to actually make us have autism. Well, here's the thing. Um, basically, autism is a word that was coined in the early 1940s uh, for a condition that has been here for a very long time. And autistic people have, have been part of the human community forever, probably. Uh, there are excellent descriptions of autism from uh, institutions in Britain in the 19th century by a guy named John Langdon Down. Um, and they're, they're perfect descriptions of autism as we know it now. A wide range of abilities and disabilities, uh, kids who appear to lose their skills dramatically in childhood. Um, however, one of the things that uh, Andrew Wakefield, the doctor who became famous for promoting the idea that vaccines cause autism, said was that that appearance of loss of skills in early childhood was a new thing caused by the MMR vaccine. That's obviously terrifying to parents. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because uh, parents felt like they had been lied to or somehow deceived over the years. That's a very understandable feeling. Uh, big Pharma is not an industry to be trusted necessarily. Um, but what I found out was that they hadn't been lied to about vaccines, but that the basic timeline of autism's discovery was incorrect as it was repeated in thousands of textbooks and Wikipedia. Right, and so what, what do we actually know about the discovery of, of autism as a medical phenomenon? The timeline that you hear about and read about is that a guy named Leo Connor, who was uh, one of the first child psychiatrists in America, discovered autism in 1943. Um, but that's not what actually happened. A guy named Hans Asperger, who was at the University of Vienna in the mid-1930s, discovered what we would now call the autism spectrum, uh, meaning it was a lifelong condition. Uh, it had a very, very wide range of clinical presentations from kids who would not be able to talk and needed almost constant assistance to chatty professors of astronomy. And so Asperger had a very, very prescient view of autism. But there was a problem. He was in Austria in the 1930s. And so in 1938, the Nazis marched in, annexed the country for the fatherland. Uh, and um, of, of course, as we know, many Jewish clinicians had to leave. One of those Jewish clinicians uh, who was working with Asperger and had a very prescient idea of the spectrum was a guy named George Frankel. He was rescued by a clinician in America named Leo Connor. And so George Frankel came to America in 1938. Um, Leo Connor saw his first autistic patient in 1938. At first he didn't know what to make of him. He sent him to George Frankel for evaluation. So that's why I say that Asperger was really the true discoverer of autism. Even still, that's still a pretty recent dis discovery, declaration, mm -hmm. naming of of, Descri yeah, of clinical a description, clinical yeah. description of, of a condition. Yeah. And and so what what was the thought that preceded early twentieth century, nineteenth century, and 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 beforehand? Well, you know, there was this very very broad and fuzzy category that they 
generally called feeble-mindedness, and there were you know, lots of terrible names applied to people who were considered feeble-minded. Clinical names used by doctors like moron and imbecile. And so uh, in the, say, in the 18th and 19th century, people with feeble-mindedness were basically put in institutions and mental asylums. There was a very uh, well-known mental asylum in England called the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, or Bedlam. Uh, and, you know, these were generally terrible places. The, the patients were mistreated. There was no understanding that they would have different conditions. So, for instance, a nonverbal autistic person might be extremely aware of their surroundings and uh, very intelligent, uh, but because they don't have the means to communicate, uh, many of those people were considered feeble-minded. Um, so, you know, and that even continued into the 20th century in America for, for a very long, still continues today in a sense. Um, Nonverbal uh, children are often considered, you know, not intelligent or whatever, but they might have a lot going on inside. Right, and, and you first began covering this with a story where, where a lot of people, when we talk about the, the, the ostensible explosion of autism in, uh, in America today or, or globally, that we had this idea that in Silicon Valley, it's, it's an extraordinary explosion. Right. And, and you wrote this book, this, this cover well, story, The Geek Syndrome. Right. Um, yeah, I, I wrote a story for Wired Magazine in 2001 called The Geek Syndrome. And it was about the hypothesis that in specialized high-tech communities, what was happening was that people who were carrying the genes for autism, which can also convey advantages in certain uh, technical and scientific fields, as well as uh, some very pervasive disabilities, that people uh, w carrying autistic genes basically had more social opportunities in the modern era because of the internet and stuff. You know, if you're working in a cubicle at some billion dollar Silicon Valley company, maybe the woman across the aisle also likes Star Trek and Dungeons and Dragons. So you had these social opportunities to meet, have kids, and uh, the kids might perhaps have a greater chance of having autism. But that article was very, very limited in its scope on purpose. Uh, I was really only focusing on high-tech communities because I was writing for Wired. What I noticed, though, was that in uh, really the decade after that article came out, as the world was having a very angry conversation about vaccines, basically every public discussion of autism was dominated by whether or not vaccines cause autism. The families of autistic people and autistic people themselves had a whole other set of problems that they were constantly writing me about. And these were problems about when kids reach a certain age, they so-called age out of services. And so the families basically have to figure out how they can help their kid with virtually no help. Um, autistic people themselves, they might be very, very bright, really want to make a contribution to society or their field, but there is no one to help them transition from high school into the workplace and teach them, say, how to get through an interview. You know, many interviews, even if the job itself is strictly technical, rely on questions like, is this guy a good team player? Or is this woman a good people person? Well, autistic people tend not to be good team players and not good people people. But they have you know, other skills that they are really eager to contribute. So autistic people and their families were basically left to twist in the wind with very little help. Meanwhile, the whole world was having an argument about vaccines. And then in the following uh, few years, the federal government committed a tremendous amount of money, millions of dollars, to researching autism. But almost all of it was devoted to finding the cause as if autism was a new thing, some historical aberration of the modern era. Right. And, and what are we left with then in terms of, of the goal around autism? It seems to me that, that there's a particular difficulty getting around what autism means, how to deal with it, that, that is presented by the spectrum mm -hmm. and the fact that you have people who are unable to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and they're called autistic. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who seem not very different than many of the people you know mm -hmm. and they're called autistic. Yes that's, yes, that's true. And that causes a tremendous amount of discontent within the autism community, I would say, because parents of children who are really profoundly disabled might say, well, these guys who are chatting on TV, they can't possibly represent my child. But there are several nuances to that that we should really pay attention to. One is that even autistic people who are 
labeled high functioning. I avoid using labels like that because I think they, they obscure true important truths. But even autistic people who are labeled high functioning are often really struggling inside. Like they're they're trying to pass, they're trying to gauge their reactions so that people think that they look normal. They're, you know, trying not to be overwhelmed by, say, like the buzzing of a fluorescent light in the, you know, in the ceiling or whatever. And so even people who look like they're not very impaired might be struggling really a lot inside. Meanwhile, even people who look very impaired or disabled might have uh, talents that could be brought out with, say, the right communication devices or the right situation or perhaps eliminate that buzzing fluorescent light. Um, so, yes, the spectrum is very broad, it's very complex, and it encompasses both super serious disability and less obvious from the outside disability. However, it turns out that there are certain things that are good for everybody all across the spectrum. Like, for instance, um, if we could reduce bullying, that would be a huge thing. Um, virtually every autistic person at every level who I interviewed for the book had been really seriously bullied when they were kids. And that's in part uh, because, you know, kids are often cruel to people they don't understand. Uh, autistic people might, you know, flap their hands or make noises or uh, otherwise do eccentric behaviors that, you know, the other kids gang up on them. But um, the problem with that is that one of the major challenges that autistic people face is chronic anxiety. And uh, childhood of bullying can set you up for a lifetime of really serious adult anxiety. So it turns out that many of the things that would make the world better for autistic people apply to everyone on the spectrum. And then, of course, there are some very specialized approaches that are better for uh, you know, people who are really profoundly disabled, like developing better communication technologies. It used to be that if you had to talk, if you had to type to talk, that all these devices were unbelievably expensive, basically. Now there, it's an iPad. Um, you can, uh, you know, buy an app for your kid and that helps them communicate. And so um, the problem is that almost all of society's commitment to uh, battling autism has gone into researching the cause. And yes, that's valuable science and valuable research. However, in the meantime, a government report just came out a couple months ago that said that the research funding on improving the lives of autistic adults was less than 2% in the United States and falling. So it's like most autistic people are adults. Why are we spending so little money finding on what helps certain autistic people really succeed and enter the workplace, and other autistic people live very lonely, desolate lives. So um, I think we need to balance our focus on what causes autism uh, with more attention to what helps the lives of autistic people. And in the end, how many autistic people are we talking about? And, and do we have really, really good numbers about the how many people are able to take care of themselves, how many people need persistent care? Well, so uh, the current uh, estimate by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, is one in 68 school, cho school children. Um, what we don't know is how many autistic adults are out there living in the community with or without a diagnosis, but check this out. Um, that kind of study was done in England a couple of years ago by a guy named Terry Bruga, and what he found was that there were exactly as many autistic adults living in the community, many of them still undiagnosed, as there are autistic kids. So that would suggest a couple of things. One is that there has been no autism tsunami, as it, you know, it's all, like parents are understandably terrified by the notion that there's an autism epidemic or an autism tsunami. Phrases like that are used uh, often by fundraising organizations. Um, you know, it gets people to open up their wallets and it attracts public attention, which autism has always been sort of starved for. But the problem with saying that there's an autism tsunami is that the, then the adults become invisible and all the focus is on the kids. And that's exactly what's happening now. So one of the main reasons why, you know, we're at 2% and falling on adult research is because people think, well, there aren't that many autistic adults, but, you know, there are all these kids who are coming up. And so, um, obviously, uh, you know, autistic kids need a lot of care and attention, and uh, some early interventions have been shown to help. Um, but what we don't know is how many autistic adults are out there struggling to get by. But also, one of the things that you're left with 
as especially when you when you have this broad spectrum, is this nagging or or, or hinting uh, sense that almost anybody who seems relatively intelligent or just slightly less than wholly engaged in uh, in in cheerleading and and the football team or whatever is 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 autistic and, and that. It, that some of the major markers for intelligence seem like a lot of the major markers for for or, or a lot of the simple results of being an intelligent person uh, or seem like a lot of the results or, or, the, or the, the symptoms of of autism that in the sense of not having the same uh, reliance on authority and 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 being skeptical in how you deal with other people and 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 so on and so forth and and it's, it, it's, it would seem that there are so many people that end up being included in the camp, and, and it gets watered down. Well, I, I completely agree with that. So did, by the way, the inventor of the spectrum, uh, or discoverer of the spectrum, uh, a, a psychiatrist in London named Lorna Wing. She told me, quote, the spectrum shades imperceptibly into eccentric normality. So what does that mean in practice? That means in practice that Jerry Seinfeld goes to see a curious incident of the, of the dog in the nighttime on Broadway and says, oh my God, I'm on the spectrum. Is he really? I mean, if Jerry Seinfeld, Mark Zuckerberg, and you know all these other Silicon Valley billionaires that people are constantly saying it, Bill is on Gates. the, you know, Bill Gates, if those people are on the spectrum, then it's, the problem is that then you think, well, what kind of help do they really need? I mean, my God, they're becoming billionaires. But the truth of the matter is that Almost every autistic person who I've met who had an official diagnosis, in other words, it's not that they diagnosed themselves taking an internet quiz or something, although many of those people who you know, did figure out that they were autistic from books or the internet really are, but everybody who I've ever met who had an official diagnosis um, really needed help. Like the, it, wasn't, you know, it wasn't just some trendy thing to say about their own geekiness. I mean, I think there's a lot of like, sort of a cocktail party chatter about, oh, he's on the spectrum, you know. But to get a diagnosis, is a, it's a pretty elaborate process. It's very demanding. It can be expensive. Um, but it's, a, it's also easy to fall victim to. Like you talk yeah. about when, you, even you, when you were interviewing uh, some, some executives in Silicon yeah. Valley and they would say, oh, by the way, you should know before you come, I have an autistic child. Yes. And then you, you, know, you showed up at, uh, at their house and, and the father, uh, who was a, a successful Silicon Valley yeah. type, had rigged up the dryer yeah. to, yeah. to show a, a, a bulb light up instead yeah. of make a, a ding because he's like, yeah. he said the ding annoys me. Right, and you but, find yourself... Yeah. Right, but here's the thing. Those are autistic traits, not necessarily auti diagnosable autism. And one of the things that Asperger really got right was that autistic traits and autism are both common. He said once you learn to recognize the traits of autism, you see them everywhere. And that's what we're all doing now. But for most of the 20th century, the, the uh, diagnostic parameters of autism were defined by that guy, Leo Connor, who insisted that autism was extremely rare, that it was limited to upper middle class white families, well, what was limited to upper middle class white families was access to Leo Connor's office, basically. Um, and so uh, we now understand that autism is a thread in the fabric of human community and that uh, it can convey not only just really serious challenges, but also serious advantages and gifts and forms of creativity. Um, and that for the world to work best, we need different kinds of minds working together. And so that's what my book is trying to inspire. And when I go back, I remember some of the earliest coverage I read of autism. The defining characteristic uh, that would be, they would make illustrations of this and so forth, was a lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. That simply they could not understand what it was like to be in someone else's head. Mm -hmm. and, and you suggest that that's not really where. No, where, I, where, no, where I suggest that that's a, yeah. it's a big lie. Um, here's the thing, I have met autistic people who care so much about how other people feel that they're almost paralyzed with anxiety that they're unintentionally hurting someone's feelings. What autistic... Well, but that's not what empathy is. Empathy is understanding someone's, someone's well, feelings. Well, that's true. I think that one of the main challenges for autistic people is taking the perspectives of other people. But there are different ways to work that out than doing it intuitively, like most typical developing people do. 
although some of them are not so good at it either. Um, so you, you can do it sort of intellectually where you, you know, learn about the situation more and understand, oh, the other person might be really sad or something. I should be careful here. Um, and one thing that uh, I think has really done a lot of damage to autistic people is the notion that, they're, that they lack empathy, that they don't care how other people feel, that they're sociopaths. I mean, many things have been said, regrettably, in recent weeks because of the plethora of school shootings that, you know, oh, these people are autistic. Well, that's not true, and sociopaths are practically the opposite of autistic people. Sociopaths know exactly how you feel and how to leverage that to their own ends, you know. Autistic people have a hard time reading social signals. So it's like, I can look at you, I can tell you're thinking, oh, this is going pretty good, <laughs> you know, it's like I can read your body language, your face. Um, autistic people can't do that. They might listen to you by looking away, and you think, oh my God, he's not listening to me. Actually, he's listening really hard. It's that if he was processing your facial expressions at the same time, it would be too much. So he's looking away so he can process your yeah, verbal, English. yeah, exactly, exactly. And so one thing that I've noticed is that autistic people often can pick up on each other's feelings really readily. So it's more like the so-called lack of empathy worth bo works both ways. If you look, you know, if you look at some of the terrible things that have been done to autistic people in history, in my book, it would seem to be the typically developing people who are lacking empathy for autistic people. So I think it works both ways. I think the notion that uh, autistic people struggle to read social signals is definitely valid that uh, they struggle to take other people's perspective is definitely valid. But once you say things like they lack empathy, it suggests a whole um, set of kind of emotional truths that are not necessarily true. And, and when we see, ultimately, you, you said you expressed a lot of doubt on the idea that Mark Zuckerberg should be considered autistic mm -hmm. or Bill Gates should be considered autistic. Although they might have autistic traits. They might, but, you know. but in the sense that so many of us might. Right. Uh, there's, there's ultimately in Silicon Valley, whether it's scientifically truthful or not, yeah. a sense that be of, of that being autistic or on the spectrum is almost a badge of pride. I know what and, you mean. Well, and, it's become and, one, yeah. you know, in the last 20 years or 15 years or so. And yeah. that becomes because there's a sense that, well, this is what these outstanding, certain outstanding geniuses were. Right. And, and therefore, if I'm an outstanding genius, maybe I'm a little autistic right. too. And, and, and that comes alongside a whole bunch of people in Silicon Valley who are also tech utopianists right. and believe they can change the world for the better. Right. And some of the things that they that they propose to change the world for the better include increasing efficiency in communication so that right. we never have to talk to each other face to face right, right, right. and allow the kinds of traits uh, or the kinds of behaviors that specifically uh, that people should be engaging in to increase empathy and this, that, and the other thing. So yeah. up with this. No, I know. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things that I talk about in my book is that, in a sense, the world has become more autistic lately in ways that benefit all, all of us. Uh, you know, 25 years ago, a kid who spoke to their friends mostly by typing on a keyboard was considered really disabled. Now they're just a teenager. And so, you know, basically, as I show in my book, people with autistic traits have not only been part of the human community in general, but very specifically part of the tech community since the big, very beginning of Silicon Valley. Uh, a um, marital therapist in the 80s wrote a book called Silicon Syndrome about women who were struggling in these relationships with what she called sci-tech men who like behave like Mr. Spock. She could have called it Asperger Syndrome. And you know, without changing another word, really. But that diagnosis hadn't been invented yet. So people with autistic traits have accelerated the progress of technology, culture, and science for a long time. But uh, in a sense, because autism was so stigmatized, we weren't aware that it was autism, really. But once you know what autistic traits look like, well, I just gave a talk at Google London. There were several people in the room, I would say, you know, were more on the spectrum than I am, shall we say. Uh, and they put that into their work. They, they use the gifts of their atypical minds to do their work. Right. And that's one of the, there is within that one of the potential pitfalls mm -hmm. in, in this process where theoretically, uh, I was speaking with, uh, with a, uh, someone over, over the weekend when I was reading this book who is a, a researcher in, in, 
in uh, clinical psychiatry. And, and he said, you know, when, we've, when we find, you know, when we test someone's blood pressure, we say, you know, it's 170 over 110. We have no problem saying that's abnormal. Right. And somehow around autism or around any mental uh, condition, people have a problem saying, well, there's, that that's abnormal and then right. and then routing around that and and, right. and dealing with that and one would think one would hope that in the same way that people in Silicon Valley who are self-diagnosing all the time and say well I, I don't have these traits that many, most people do that one would say all right well then maybe you need to particularly design the way you live and work and manage and 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 treat others to to acknowledge for that well, and, and, I, I think they are designing their yeah, lives, actually, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley who really don't like to talk face-to-face -face or, right. you know, they prefer text or they don't like to talk on the phone. Right. Some autistic people love the phone. I love the phone. I'm not autistic. But, you know, some, some people basically avoid the phone because, uh, you know, they can't handle the interpretation of the tones of voice and stuff like that. So I think that we're all kind of adapting the world to suit our needs. I don't think it's a secret that uh, a lot of people in Silicon Valley know that they or suspect that they're on the spectrum. And one of the things that happened when the criteria for diagnosis were radically broadened in the 80s and 90s, which produced the appearance of this autism epidemic and tsunami, is that um, parents whose kids were getting diagnosed with autism suddenly, real, you know, they would read descriptions of Asperger's syndrome, and it's like, oh, actually, that's me, you know? And so one of the things that is encouraging people to be aware of their own autism is if their kids get diagnosed, basically. And, you know, anybody who's been around autism for a long time, it's like, it's no secret that it runs in families. Like, it, not always, you know, there, there, you know, there are always people who say, I had no autistic relatives, and yet my kid is really profoundly disabled. Yeah, sure, of course that happens. But... There are definitely families that have more autistic traits, and then when you know if a kid is born very autistic, it's not exactly a surprise. Right. But then at the same time, when we look for genetic markers of autism, mm -hmm. you talk about some of the that they raise in some senses more doubt than certainty. La la la. Just More kidding. doubt than certainty. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speaking about the ways in which digital and analog right, right. interact. All right, where were we? Uh, more doubt in genetic studies raise more right. doubt. Right, and, and, so, and so we, ha and, and then one of the things that you report on, though, is about how uh, it, within diagnosing or, or finding the cause of, of autism, that genetic studies have found more doubt than certainty in, in a way, in, in that there's, uh, there are, there are some markers that people think they've identified, researchers think they've identified for autism, and then they're shared by 1% of the, the Yeah, autism that's the community. thing. I mean, when they don't raise doubt about the notion that genes contribute to autism. That's definitely true. And, you know, the problem with finding genetic markers for autism is not that we haven't been able to find them, it's that we found too many. We found uh, between 600 and 1,000 uh, potential candidate genes for autism. Uh, and also we understand that it's not just genetics because you can have two identical twins, one of whom is autistic and one of whom is not. That's slightly unusual, but it definitely happens. So there's some kind of interaction going on between genes and the environment. And most people, uh, when they hear the phrase environment, they think, oh, that must mean like pesticides or vaccines or air pollution or something. But it also means the environment of the mother's womb. Like, what is the balance of hormones in the mother's womb? Some researchers are looking at that. So the thing is that we understand that there are a lot of um, uh, potential biomarkers for autism, but there's nothing where you could have a blood test and you know determine whether or not a child is autistic. What if you could? What if you could do uh, you know, amniocentesis and figure out that the child was autistic? Well, then that raises the threat of you know, prenatal abortion. 
The problem with that is that autism seems to be a sort of fellow traveler in the human gene pool with many things that are good. So if we started selectively you know, using abortion to eliminate autism, we could really mess up humanity's future in general. Well, finding where that continuum of behaviors and, 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 and what have you uh, leads us as we try to find the right future here will yeah. be the big question. Steve yeah. Silverman, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It was and now, stories of the wrongfully imprisoned with Ruvain Fenton. There's a lot of discussion now about mass incarceration, about that there are too many people in prison, uh, and, and people talking about, well, we should have less restrictive laws, we should have this, that, and the other thing. But one of the things that you're talking about here is that a not insubstantial portion of the prison population is innocent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it could be as high as 5% according to some people, which put the number at a staggering 100,000. Um, statistically, uh, you know, I, how they come, how they figure these studies out, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, this, but this is this is coming from what I what I've been reading on, uh, from the Innocence Project, which, it, which takes the helm in, in, in wrongful convictions. Um, it 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 may not be that high. I, I think the, you know the studies uh, they say it could be anywhere between 2.5 and 5 percent. Other studies have said it's as low as one percent, but still, I mean, about talk, tens of thousands. Tens of, you know, as little as tens of thousands. I mean, we're just you know an incredible number of people who who will probably never get out of prison because, you know, uh, only a a very small percentage of the ones who are in prison who are innocent actually make it out. There's all sorts of of, of barriers that stand in the way. First of all, getting uh, attorneys to take on your case um, after you've been locked in behind bars for ten years or more. And then uh, actually um, uh, getting the inmate out is an, is an incredibly difficult process, uh, you know, to prove innocence. So uh, we're talking about uh, uh, people who are behind bars who, who are almost guaranteed they're going to stay. I think the, uh, the National Registry of Exonerations uh, since 1989 has only listed less than 2,000 people who've gotten out. So, right, which is in aggregate, and you said it, it's not even a hundred people a year. Yeah. Where if you assume that between w even one percent of people are are actually innocent going to jail, we're putting in far more innocent people every year than we're than we're than we're exonerating. Yes, yes. Right, and and one of the uh, one of the more surprising ways that people end up in jail if they're innocent is through false confession. And mm -hmm. you said according to the, the database of, of exonerations, uh, th more than 10%, about 13%, I think you said, mm -hmm. are giving false confessions. How does that happen? For whatever reason, I, I keep thinking about, uh, when I think about this book, I think about Holocaust survivors, and I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, people ask, like, how, how were Holocaust survivors, how did they get to the point when, when, they, when they would willy, willingly walk into the gas chambers? And, and I think uh, uh, up until that last second, they just couldn't believe that this was actually happening. So looking at, uh, at and from the standpoint of somebody who, who's, you know, going about his normal life, and all of a sudden, these detectives grab him, and they throw him into an interrogation room and they start like throwing questions at him and the guy's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. But then the, the process gets so intense because uh, hours go by and they keep repeating the questions over and over again and they're wearing the guy down and he's just, he's just sweating and he's becoming exhausted. It's like imagine, uh, imagine uh, just standing in one place for 10 hours straight, you know, your, your whole state of mind changes and uh, you, you don't know what's going on. Uh, and, and, and at least one case in particular, James Klubelberg from Chicago, he actually got, he got tossed around the room, he got beaten up. Um, right, you said he was, he was pissing blood yeah, for Yeah, when days. he was pissing blood, when he, when he, when he got thrown in jail. Uh, you're just at this point where it's like, I'll do anything to, you're not of the right mind. You're just saying, I will do anything to get these people off my back. And maybe if I just, give them what they want, maybe we can clear this up later or something. I just need to get out of the situation. But, but that's, that's it, and then it gets used against them. Against them. In Kloppelberg's case, the judge tossed the wrongful, the uh, coerced confession. But not, uh, not in the case of Damon Thibodeau, who ended up, excuse me, Thibodeau, who, uh, from New Orleans, who, you know, that ended up being used against him as, I think, the primary piece of evidence, despite all this other evidence showing that he was innocent, the, the confession did him in. Right, and, and obviously that says a lot about 
the way our criminal justice system works that we end up with these false confessions that are in large part coerced. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, what's amazing also is that one thing, there's one word that could have ended those interrogations immediately, right? Lawyer. Yes, and it's amazing. I, uh, well, uh, something I found again and again is people uh, who were just completely unaware of their rights up until, you know, the, well, putting that aside for a second, asking for your lawyer, um, th some of these guys, they, they'd say like, you know, we went to trial and I, I would sit in the courtroom and I wasn't really paying that much attention. I didn't really know what was going on that much when like, like a, a, a Drayton Witt of Arizona who was accused of, of shaking his infant son to death. You know, he, he was telling me how, you know, I, I was sitting there in court and, and I wasn't really following what these experts were saying as, as one after the next was, was, uh, was using this like sh shady science uh, to, to, uh, to prove that I, uh, that I had killed my son. Um, and uh, and, and, and uh, it, it's just this whole idea, like, I think most people don't really know that much about their rights. You know, I think if you ask the average person on the street, you know, they, they might not know that, that they can ask for a lawyer, you know, and, and that they'll be, they'll be given a lawyer, you know, which is, which is astounding. Right, which is a different version of America and, and the reality of our citizenry than we get from from police and prosecutors who will say that the reason they have trouble making cases is because everybody's watching CSI and mm -hmm. everybody's watching for mm -hmm. all this DNA evidence. Yeah. But I guess that maybe that means that they feel that juries are, are, are heavily educated in these things, but maybe defendants aren't? I, I don't know if juries, if juries are, are as educated as we'd like to think. You know, I, I think juries end up in. now. But that being said, you know, you mentioned Law and Order and CSI. The, the, many of the people in this book uh, got locked up before these shows were popular. I would just like to point yeah. that out. Um, and 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 I do think the public is is gradually becoming more savvy. Really, I mean, as you say, just like through from TV watching, watching, watching fictional shows, you learn quite a bit. But what's going on here uh, in terms of in terms of injustice? There's also this idea in the criminal justice system in America generally, right, we have this idea that, that uh, innocence isn't actually a bar you need to reach and that, that you can just need to reach reasonable doubt and, mm -hmm. and, someone, and someone is declared not guilty. Mm -hmm. and, you would, and overall, that should lead to an, an, an extreme caution and overabundance of people who are guilty r walking mm -hmm. and, and, and a very, very rare instance of someone who is innocent to actually ending up in jail. Do you think that's actually how it ends up happening? The, so you're asking me if I think that, that uh, okay. Like, like, do you think that our criminal justice system is, is then properly weighting this disparity or this, uh, this situation to, to get more innocent people off, but also the not, the not the reasonable doubt of guilt off to the point where we, we should be seeing an extreme minority of, of innocent people ending up in jail. Mm -hmm. are we, do you feel that that's what we're seeing? My sense is, is, that, is that things are, well, that, th that, I'm, that things are gradually improving in the sense that, uh, that I, I think that more and more people are becoming aware of this issue is what's happening. So, um, so, so they're, they're, they're keeping that more in mind. Juries are keep, keeping that a little bit more in mind maybe than they used to about, uh, about okay, you know, you know, trying to assess their own doubt, you know, uh, in a courtroom. Because, uh, you know, it, what it really boils down to, I think a lot of the time, is, is who, who's putting on a better performance, the, you know, the defense or the prosecutor. Uh, you know, if if your uh, if your defense lawyer isn't isn't creating enough of that doubt, you know the 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 prosecutor is going to steamroll. Um, which brings me to I, I think one of the fundamental issues is this desire to win cases, um, which I think might be the fundamental cause of all this. You know, wh when it's your job to prosecute and to win cases, I think I think that's where things get skewed for, for in the prosecutor's mind. Um, it brings to mind that uh, I once had. Uh, a friend who had worked in, in Bob Morgenthau's office in the Manhattan DA and said that she felt one of the major differences between that office and other offices, and I'm sure there are lots of people who feel differently about mm. this, but that she felt that there was this, this, uh, this philosophy from on high, this order from on high, that if you don't actually believe someone's guilty, you should not be prosecuting them. 
mm. and 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 um, and within this, within some of the stories you tell, we see prosecutors and law enforcement who, at various points, turned down evidence or, or testimony mm -hmm. that would have gone the other way. They just they didn't disclose it. They didn't use it, mm -hmm. and. Um, and and you end up with a situation where the prosecutorial misconduct uh, and and similar misconduct by police and what have you ends up being a major major cause of these exonerations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, and I would like to think uh, uh, that that the, the the Manhattan DA may realize. Well, first of all, you know, this is New York, and New York is New York is a much more liberal city uh, to begin with, which I th which is a, an important point, I think. Um, I think that Manhattan DA also realizes the, the high profile nature of the cases that he's handling. You know, all eyes are on Manhattan, and maybe that influences, you know, I, okay, guys, we really got to be careful about, about how we handle these cases. Let, you know, if, if, the, if we think the defendant is, is, is innocent, he's innocent. And, and, I, and I hope that this is uh, uh, something that, that DAs, you know, across the country are taking on more and more, but, uh, but unfortunately, I think that. Uh, so many of them are are, uh, are are still you know very eager to to pile up the numbers you know uh, the quota you know is always an issue uh, you know police departments we all know about quotas being an issue the number of arrests number of tickets number of summonses so uh, you know I, I don't know if uh, I, I like I said I think change is gradual the, the the media pays a lot more attention to this than they used to you know that tends to 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 affect you know like no police officer nowadays would ever want to admit that that, they, that there's quotas for for tickets and things like that and and you end up with a situation there where like like in so many bureaucracies and in so many companies and so many organizations if you measure something that ends up being what you target and if you measure and it's very easy to measure prosecutions arrests wins in court mm -hmm. it you talk about the idea of measuring justice and how prosecutor and, and how prosecutors offices should be aiming toward measuring justice but that's a, a very ephemeral thing re on a relative basis it's harder to measure uh, justice and it becomes the kind of thing that you can't really do on a spreadsheet and you can't really do on a table you can't I mean like it's like yeah it's like how do you I mean how do you measure a case? <laughs> You know, if, if, if like you know, case it's all about you know cases that you win. Like you know, it's like the whole the whole idea of, of dropping cases. It's 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 counterintuitive. You know, uh, like oh, you want me to do the opposite of what I was trained to do? Oh, you know, it, it's it's counterintuitive, um, and and I think that's part of the problem. Um, but uh, and and it's, it's like it's like how do you yeah it's like like measuring justice it, it is it, it's a very abstract thing and it's amazing how some of these people get railroaded not just in the false confessions but like one of the stories you talk about this woman Deborah Brown mm -hmm. who by and large the evidence against her was more or less that she'd stolen from somebody mm -hmm. but then she and she was the one who found the body and reported the mm -hmm. body but other than that. And, and there was a, a fair amount of exculpatory stuff out there, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's just amazing how she got railroaded all the way to prison. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up her case because you know uh, th th I think that very much was a, a character, um, a, a, an assessment of character by the jury. You know, this 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 happened in, in Utah, you know, where the majority of people are, are religious, you know, Mormons, and uh, and in her, her case, the, the evidence was brought out that she uh, the night before. Um, uh, the the, the, mur the uh, murder. She was uh, with her boyfriend, and they they were in a hot tub together. And and this is very scandalous. And and this was brought up during her trial. Well, very scandalous in Utah. In Utah, right? You know, so a Utah jury, and 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 the pro and the prosecution had to have known this. Um, there was, you know, the the uh, evidence in her case. There, there was no clear evidence that she had committed any murder whatsoever. But so you've got the hot tub, and of course the the forging of the checks, which is something that she admitted to, not at the time, but but years later she she did admit to that. Um, you know, she was very ashamed of herself for having done that, and uh, and it, it's it's amazing. Um, and and what's interesting about her, I think I mentioned this is because her defense lawyer said, you know, I, I I suggest you don't go up and testify yourself. Because right now you look so bad, because of your hot tubbing and your check forging, that that it, it's only going to hurt you if you go up there. Which is one of those things about how we're now talking about criminal justice in America that really goes against the grain of what our our justice system is supposed to be. Where, for example, in the Black Lives Matter discussion, we have a whole lot of people saying, "Well." 
this guy held up a, a store, and this guy, you know, and this guy was uh, was was doing this or that misdemeanor, mm -hmm. and it, the whole idea is, well, yeah, we we abolished the death penalty for uh, for petty crimes quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. we, th this is simply not. We don't hang people for for stealing some cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And similarly here, we're not supposed to be giving people life in prison or the death penalty or even any. Or or, any, or or put them in jail at all for simply being not up to one sense of morality, but it happens time and again. Yes, it does. I, I'm, I'm just reading this fantastic book called On the Run. Um, it's just basically about uh, uh, fugitives, because that's what they are in Philadelphia, young people who uh, committed petty crimes, um, and, and, and then they're, they're, uh, th there's a, a warrant out against them because they didn't pay all their court fees, or, uh, or, or they, they, or some maybe they were they were caught with a joint or something like that, and and they're literally on the run. But the, it just it just fosters it 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 helps uh, just foster a society of people who are you know mistrusting of the police, who are you know kind of virtually guaranteed that at one point or another they're going to be thrown in jail for a year, you know, two years, three years for for some small offense, and it and it just really you know like like you, you talk about wanting wanting to to uh, you know, uh, lift communities up, um, but well, I guess it takes it takes two. On one hand, you know, you you want you know you want people to stop committing petty crimes, but then you know it's. But on the other hand, uh, you know, when the when when the uh, the influence on them is just that. Okay, no matter what we do, we're going to go to jail. Uh, you know, it 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 just fosters this whole uh, attitude of mistrust and and just crimes keep perpetuating themselves. Now uh, w you got on this beat, on this uh, on this trajectory of covering these these stories, when you were covering for the Post a story about a, a pretty famous case about mm -hmm. a murdered rabbi mm -hmm. and a man exonerated after 22 years. Yeah. Uh, what about that story drove you to f to find more? Of it? Uh, it, it was the emotional impact. It was um, being in the courtroom when uh, the judge. To, you know, uh, said, told this guy David Ranta that he was free to go, and I just watched him get up, and I watched him walk past that that wooden barrier that separates the the courtroom side from the gallery, and and he went and hugged his daughter, and 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 witnessing that was 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 unforgettable. Um, that's when I started this project. Um, I was really you know more than interesting, uh, more than anything else, just interested in in the stories. Um, I wasn't think, even thinking at the time as much about the the call to action that that, that this book needed. I was just like, wow, wow that's you know, as a journalist, you know, we're we're always thinking about stories. Well, I mean, what a well, story. An story! Yeah, yeah. And, and and in David Ranch's case, I just remember the press conference afterwards. Um, you know, it was, it was it was a chaotic press conference. There were uh, it was a huge story. You know, made front pages all over the all over the country. I think. Um, but uh, you know, it was all just like, hey, you know, what, what's the first thing you're going to do? Uh, you know, how do you feel to be out? What's the first? What, what are you going to go uh, have to eat now? Things like that, which is all great stuff. But I, I just remember thinking, like, well, this guy has has this whole amazing, tragic story to tell, and and we're we're not even getting to it now. We're just, uh, you know, because that's the nature of breaking news. So I was like, well, you know, if that if breaking news can only go this far. Uh, I'd like to go uh, quite a bit deeper, you know, as deep as I can. And one of the results of the Ranta case is, is an, a long-term investigation of potential poor prosecutions by the Brooklyn DA. Mm -hmm. And there are some names in the, in the general stories of the wrongfully <laughs> imprisoned that come up again and again and again, and the Brooklyn DA is now one of them. Sure. Harry Connick Sr. in in New Orleans is is one of them where mm -hmm. it's just so many cases uh, from Louisiana keep coming up where mm -hmm. there was prosecutorial misconduct. We have some really bad actors out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and to what degree do you think we're getting we're we're, we're actually getting to a greater truth? Um, I I I think it's it's like slowly but surely. I mean that's you know I, I don't know if you've noticed the the. This has become a subject now that I think maybe even five years ago I don't remember hearing this this subject come up very much. It did, but but not to the level it is. And it's all about just. Ma I, I think the 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 press plays a huge huge role. Role. Um, 
you know, the, the more, the, you know, the more stories we cover on a single subject, the more uh, people get pointed out, you know, for their faults and, and, and uh, you know, pay the price. Um, and I think that's what's happening here. I think, uh, you know, I, I hope to sell a lot of copies of this book. I mean, I, but I, I hope that, uh, you know, a lot of people read it and, and you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to, I just want to contribute to that, to you know to what I can do, you know, as a press person. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I, to me, it, all, it, it comes back to the press time and time again, because otherwise, if nobody's watching you, you're just going to keep doing what you're doing. And when we spoke uh, before you came in, uh, and you mentioned how y a Jewish philosophy and, and, a, and a Jewish upbringing led you to have a particular perspective on the story and to perceive the importance of this story in a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, what is some of that? Again and again, I, I, I mentioned before, it's like I, I just keep thinking about the Holocaust, which, which is a completely different subject. But um, it's the idea of, of, of a stolen life. You know, in the case of Holocaust, you know, there, there, there is a parallel there, and I, and, I, and I keep thinking about that. I keep thinking about the idea, uh, and this is what haunts me, is the idea of, of you know, you're, you're living a, a relatively normal life. Um, you may be wealthy, you may be poor, whatever, you know, urban, rural, and then all of a sudden, like, this unbelievable thing happens to you that you just can't believe, and it's, it's, the, it's the disbelief that I think haunts me. Like, you know, I, the, the idea, so in, in the case of Stolen Years, you know, you're, you're um, in court, you're asked to stand, for, you know, to, to hear the verdict, and you think that, that the verdict, the jury foreman's gonna say not guilty. And then they say guilty, and you just you just can't believe what's happening. And 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 I and I think that's what I, that's the way I imagine you know people who went to concentration death camps. They they'd get on the train. They think okay, the, you know, this is bad, but but it's not you know. And then they'd, they'd get to the and up until the minute they'd be like herded into the gas chambers, they'd be thinking like, no, this is never going to happen. And then it would. And and to me like that's that that may. That was one of the, the fundamental things that, that gave me, I think, a fascination about these cases. The, uh, the, 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 the random victimization it wasn't so random in, in, during the Holocaust, but just that from, I think from the point of view of the people, they're like, what's going on? You know? So I think you know, as, as a Jew, that's, what, that's one of the things. And, we just, and it's, just, it's just part of our history. you know. You know, persecution. Being wrongfully imprisoned is uh, well, uh, yeah, that <coughs> and, and just persecution mm -hmm. in general. You know, uh, you know, the, a sense of always looking over all, our shoulder for you know, uh, like we, you know, it's almost almost. Ex I think, and a lot. I know a lot of you know Jewish people, particularly you know older Jewish people, who almost expect seem to expect uh, tragedy to occur. Like there's there's like almost a likelihood of it right. because how could there not be given all that's happened, all the uh, seemingly uh, 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 the seemingly uh, like random events that have happened to us over the you know the, over the millennia. All right. Well, let's see if uh, if we can t avoid some tragedy in the future with better education, better press. Ruvain Fenton, thank you for joining us. Thank you. That's all for this week's episode of Up Close. A reminder: you can also listen to an audio-only version of this program as a free podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player.